From Los Angeles, the home of film and television, this is Film Music Live, a webcast featuring outstanding composers, orchestrators, filmmakers, and more from the world of music for film, television, and video games, talking about their work and answering your questions. Film Music Live is sponsored by the Film Music Network and Film Music Institute. And now the host of Film Music Live, Daniel Schweiger. Hey everyone, I'm Daniel Schweiger, and welcome to Film Music Live, the show where you get to ask the questions to today's top composers. I'm happy to have you here. Of the many concepts that martial arts icon Bruce Lee had to make himself a Hollywood star, only to have his presence cut short, if certainly not his legacy, one of the most epically unrealized was his idea of a Chinese immigrant making a brutal pilgrim's progress through San Francisco's gang-controlled Chinatown at the turn of the century. Leave it to Jonathan Tropper, who'd count the grittily unique Banshee, N.C., to his action resume to turn Lee's dream into kick-ass reality. Debuting on Cinemax in 2019, Warrior immediately impressed with its very modern mix of ultra-violence, humorous attitude, and resonant racist attacks to create the show that Kung Fu could only dream of in terms of its visceral impact and period look. Gracing the lightning-fast attacks and often backstabbing character interplay was the contemporarily mean-ass scoring of H. Scott Salinas and Reza Safinia. By combining spaghetti western rhythms with hard-rocking guitar, dangerous strings, and even emotional tenderness, this creative team made Warrior anything but dated or musically anachronistic. Instead, it's a streamer and scoring of the pummeling, adrenaline-filled moment that's made Warrior into a show that refused to die. Now, after a two-year intermission, this ultimate tong has returned with a truly dynamic season three, where the interplay between the oppressed immigrants, Chinese-hating coppers, morally conflicted criminals, and even more sadistic politicians all come to the counterfeit four with adrenaline and drama to spare for a show that does Bruce Lee's iconic brand of action and magnetism proud for an old setting that's more excitingly fresh and currently impactful than ever. And now here are our composing team and show creator who know how to kick ass the tong way. Welcome to Warriors, H. Scott Salinas, Reza Safinia, and Jonathan Tropper. Well, I mean, it, it's great having you guys here. I mean, this the season three is just totally on fire. I, really, it's it's I, for me, it's absolutely the best one yet. And I guess my first question goes to you, Jonathan. Um, you know, you have a very eclectic resume between, you know, very heartfelt family dramas like This Is Where I Leave You to, you know, some pretty rowdy action shows like C and Banshee. How how did Warrior come your way and how did you adapt Bruce Lee's original idea into what became the show? Well, I was doing Banshee for Cinemax, uh, and the guys at Cinemax knew that I was a big uh, martial arts fan and Bruce Lee fan. And um, I guess uh, Justin and Shannon Lee were putting together Warrior. Justin had approached Shannon about her father's lost papers. And uh, the guys at Cinemax said, you have to meet Jonathan. He's the guy to do this. So I sat down with them, read, read Bruce's treatments, and then began conceiving a show that would, like, make a lot more noise than a standard period piece. I wanted to do something that was a lot edgier and that, you know, had a bit more fun to it. And so I spent, you know, the next while doing a tremendous amount of research into that period uh, because it was something I didn't really know much about. And then trying to frame the show in a way that would be the opposite of the Merchant Ivory version, but doing something that would really, you know, celebrate the martial arts and at the same time celebrate the pulp and the fun and the swagger of Bruce Lee. And that's what I... That's what I came up with. What were the biggest changes, though, in, in adapting it, uh, you know, to what it was, to what it became? Well, what it was wasn't really a fully fleshed out show. It was the idea of a show. And it had one or it had the main character, Assam, and it had the character of Big Bill, uh, possibly one other character. It was more the notes are more about the essence of what the show was. But, you know. You have to realize that Bruce Lee did that in the 70s when TV was largely case of the week procedural stuff and there weren't really anti-heroes. So I think it was taking his idea, but then taking a much more uh, current television take on it and realizing that, you know, this isn't going to be a case of the week. It isn't going to be, 
you know, a noble, you know, Kung Fu hero, but it's going to be very complex characters uh, where everyone could be a hero or a villain in a, at any given time and really just a, adjusting it to sort of the television uh, template we have today. Now, Scott and Rissa, mm -hmm. um, tell me uh, how about your own respective musical beginnings and how you first teamed together. And I think your first teaming was the uh, Bruce Lee kind of biopic, uh, you know, that came out. As you first. Oh. Um, well, Scott and I have a mutual friend uh, that Scott went to university with. And when I moved to LA 15 years ago, um, he just said, you should meet Scott. So Scott and I just went for like to have a meeting that was probably only supposed to be half hour, one hour. We ended up like hanging out like four hours in the studio that very day. So we instantly hit it off and connected. We had the real um chemistry of our musical influences and kind of like we 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 did slightly different things musically but the things that scott did were things that i aspired to do and the things that i did were things that scott aspired to do and so we found each other very inspiring and we were very interested in the other person's methods and we just started working on, on things together from the get-go and over time you know, I adopted some of his style and he adopted some of my style in some of the things that we do individually. But we've been working for on and off for 15 years together on various projects. So that's kind of how it happened. Sky, how about you? What? How did it all start? How? How? What was your impression of Reza? Yeah. Um, uh, remember, he came to visit me in my studio. I think it was like, I feel like it was somewhere between 2008 and 2010. And um, I was just like, holy moly, this guy is a force of nature. <laughs> uh, I was blown away. At the time, I was running a commercial music house and then doing a lot of independent film scoring. And uh, that actually inspired me to sort of course correct a little bit. Within a couple of years, I kind of removed myself from the advertising world, even though that was going very well, and focused back on uh, films and television longer form. And I think Rez was a big part of that because he came from records. He produced some really, really big records, uh, famous ones, and sort of just had this real strong life force and energy. And I'd been sort of grinding <laughs> on this already for 10 or 12 years. And he really uh, reinvigorated me. And, and yeah, we wound up working on quite a things, few things together, some of which folks have never heard, some of which, you know, became uh, parts of other projects that came out. And then that that Bruce Lee film, the, um, what was the name of that movie? Why can't Birth I think? Birth of the Dragon. Birth of the Dragon, yeah. Um, that was, you know, that was really like, okay, we're going to score a film. We recorded big orchestra. And um, that was... That was, I guess, the real proof of concept of like putting our ideas together on a grand uh, scale, and that was that was a ton of fun. We had a great time on that one. Um, what was it like uh, again? You know, getting a taste of uh, Warrior through uh, Birth of the Dragon. I mean, do you think any kind of stuff came up there that you would apply later on? I it, it was almost like Birth of the Dragon was like almost like what not to do. <laughs> for Warrior. Uh, Warrior, you know, the sound of it was, you know, what we were going for was something very pulpy and at times cinematic, but, you know, it, it should always feel uh, really coming from the genre and, and, and from, you know, that set of characters, which, you know, you have some very historically accurate beautiful sets and then you guys have guys walking through wearing really cool modern like armani suits you know what I mean? so that was i think that how you juxtapose that you know modern versus traditional and then there's this like you said there's this kick butt you know badass quality and sort of edginess to it um that uh it really took us in a completely different direction but it was interesting to uh, in a way, it's some similar material because we have these complex fights, right? And approach them in a, in a totally different way. 
Now we've got our first question from uh, Benjamin Michael Joffe, which uh, kind of goes to mine. Um, can you talk about how you found the musical tone for the show over three seasons? I mean, Jonathan, what were Scott and Reza completely obvious right from the start to score the series? And what was it like developing the tone of the show? I'll so, take this one. <laughs> oh, sorry, go on. Go on, I was go for it. That, you know, we, we, I, I, I interviewed, uh, um, I think, three different composers. Um, and and honestly, the, the fact that they had done Birth of the Dragon had nothing to do with it. I looked at that as a very different kind of project. And, you know, in fact, uh, if anything, that would have been a strike against them only because, you know, one of our EPs, uh, Shannon Lee, Bruce Lee's daughter, is not a fan of that movie. Um, but at the same time, it was just instant. You know, I knew when I explained what I was going for with the show that these guys instantly understood what I meant. And I don't remember if we had a little bit of a bake off. I seem to recall you guys, like we gave you like three scenes to score. Was that how we did it? That's yeah. what I was going to say. So yeah. uh, we, we had those three scenes and we also had a little one sheet with like a direction. <laughs> and it, and the one sheet was very funny because it mentioned so many different styles of music. <laughs> so it wasn't really giving us a direction, you know, because it was too broad to actually give a direction. However, it's just really amazing how um, language can be so limited as a communication tool. And yet at the same time, in the metadata of the language, you can somehow understand what someone means because by seeing such a wide range of things that were written in that one sheet and just the way it was written. I personally just had a very instinctual feeling. I was like, I know exactly what these guys want. And then, you know, when I called Scott, you know, we spoke about it and he felt exactly the same way. And, and you know, it just felt completely clear what we had to do, even though what was the instructions we were given were like not very clear in literal ways, you know, especially once we saw the three scenes, it was just like automatic. Like we didn't even think too hard about it. We just went and nailed it. You know, I mean, I don't want to say we nailed it, but I mean, we, we just worked very, very, very hard uh, without taking a break, you know, because we just had automatic sense of what to do. And, and then, you know, everybody liked it. And then it turned out, you know, that it was good. <laughs> yeah, and just another little point, the whatever we did for the demo or audition, whatever you want to call it, it's fairly intact in, in uh, season one, episode one, especially the first scene uh, when he's, like, getting off the boat and there's all this chaos, and uh, definitely the essence of it is still there, so... Uh, the, the other nice thing was to be kind of, you know, uh, beyond just, hey, we got the job. There was a sense that we had made some progress already in, in actually doing the job, which is always nice. Wow. Um, so I guess let, let's talk to, uh, I think, you know, for me, a, a way even into shows that I haven't seen yet is when you hear just music that just totally grabs you and you have to watch the show to see what the music came from, which brings us to uh, a question from uh, Ivan Sorkin, the Bond music. Um, I haven't seen the whole series yet, but I listened to the main theme recently and it really intrigued and amazed me. What was your inspiration for this theme? I, and I got to ask visually as well as sonically. Well, before you guys get into that, I would just say, if I recall correctly from season one, they were scoring a fight and they wrote the initial version of that theme for this fight. And I remember watching the uh, clip with the fight and thinking that wasn't what I wanted for the fight, but then saying to them, guys, I think you just may have written the theme for the show. Is that how you guys remember it? It was something... It was something like that. I don't think it was, well, it, there was a fight scene uh, that, that had the backbeat for the main titles. And then there was a separate scene that we did that was, uh, it was sort of like the hopway. Was it, um, the walk? was it the hopway walk? It was the, the hopway I, walk. The one that I drove you guys insane over. <laughs> right, exactly. Yes. So, so the melody came from the hopway walk, which was a lot slower. It was like a 90 BPM. And then that action scene was like a higher BPM. Um, and then the main title kind of took the backbeat from the fight scene with the melody of the Hopway Walk and put them together. 
But yeah, we had this very iconic scene that was really important to me in the beginning of the show, which was when Assam first puts on the suit and then he takes this walk through Chinatown with the other gangsters and he kind of understands the world he's just entered. And I think that's the only time I really drove you guys crazy where no matter what they did, I wasn't quite thinking it was what I had. And it's the most, it's the most impossible thing to describe musically a feeling that you have. But I remember when they wrote that music, I was like, well, I don't think that's for this, but I really think that might be the theme for the show. I just remember getting very excited about that piece of music. And I hear from so many people that we have one of the only main title sequences that they don't fast forward because they like to kind of bop to the music as they're getting yeah, into it. That's the gold standard. Yeah. Uh, one just quick thing on the main title uh, that I think is interesting. You know, I think people can hear the influences. Obviously, there's hip hop. There's like a spaghetti western. There's a pulp. So, all the all the influences of the show are in there. And then I think the other thing, Rez and I talked a lot about, was exactly what you just said, Jonathan. Like I have this theory about main titles that if they're too much of an earworm, if they're too overly tuny in the wrong way, even if you love it the first three times, you're still going to switch it. So we had conversations about how to make it catchy, and have an arc, and have a tune but not a tune that you want to hit next on after, you know, the eighth or the ninth listen, one that you'd be willing to get through every. So that was actually something we talked a lot about. And so I'm glad to hear that. that, that something else we, we spoke a lot about, about the main title, but it actually has become a broader conversation throughout the, in, the whole score for all three seasons actually was about how to um, honor the fact that it is a show about, you know, people of Chinese heritage um, without overly, um, you know, writing Chinese music, you know, but hinting at it in, in a certain kind of way, uh, in, a, in a respectful way, whilst doing something within our own artistic realm. And, and I think that that is definitely something, Scott, you might want to speak to as well. But like we, we spoke a lot about that, about the main title and throughout the show. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's a big challenge. But anyway, we'll, we could go on with that. <laughs> how, how would you say, we're talking about the first two seasons, how would you say that the, the score helped to develop these characters? I, I think it all, the, you know, I think everything, I, I look at it as all equal parts. Like, you know, we create them on the page, right? Actors then breathe life into them. Costume breathes life into them score breathes life into them, stunts breathes life into them. It really becomes kind of everybody takes their piece of the pie and does something that that generates it. So, you know, I don't think any, you know, I can't quite quantify what each one does, but I just know they all work together to create the overall tone of the show and the characters. And I, I know, for instance, there's this great theme they wrote for Atoy, who runs the brothel. And we love that music so much. And I know that that music after season one definitely impacted the way we kind of wrote her entrances and the way we thought about the way she moves through the brothel. And, you know, so I think things like that happen very unconsciously. Once you've watched a few episodes as you're moving on to season two, the music, the costumes, it's all become part of, of the way you sort of, you know, holistically view the work of the show. What do you think, Scott and uh, Reza? Well, another thing to take into account, which is unusual, is the um, the amount for three seasons. This this show has spent a lot of time in real life of making it because you know we were shut down and pandemic and this and now we're back and and so there was quite a journey, especially to season three, and um, to me one of the really interesting things on this latest season was everyone coming back in and looking under the hood again and going like, so we've got all these themes and what's this theme again? And and revitalizing themes for characters that have made it through all the seasons and some of them, you know, developing their arc even more or perhaps finishing their story. And so it was, it was really rewarding to come back to that material after it had literally just sat for a while and life had gone on and pandemic and all these... I had a kid, you know, all these things happen. And then to see that that material uh, still held up and was like, you know, fertile 
fertile seeds that we could, you know, grow season three with. So that was that was a really neat for me to see that uh, that it worked out that way. Yeah, I mean, Jonathan, what was it like with that layover? I think it was like two or three years between seasons like two and three. Two and three. It, was over, it was two and a half years. I mean, I was terrified, honestly. I I think. As soon as I knew we were coming back, um, I started calling department heads. And my big fear was that if if we couldn't get Scott and Reza back for some reason, the idea of trying to orient and educate and bring in someone else who could potentially do what they did uh, was so daunting to me. So I was thrilled when like they jumped right back in because I, you know, the score is very important to us on the show, and it's something we all really. Um, we all relate to and we all talk about it. And it's the funniest thing, which Scott and Reza, you guys have never seen, but when we do the mixes, so all the producers and all the writers are in this studio with the show up on the big screen and we don't fast forward through the main titles. We watch the whole episode and every single member of, of the team who has seen these episodes 50 times already, still everyone just sits there like kind of doing this for the theme and popping <laughs> a little bit and like, um, so yeah, it was it, it, you know it was really the, the the process of rediscovery was both you know daunting but also really exciting because we had the same team back together. So I was never really the not having to ever explain it again was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I just absolutely love the character development. You know, in, in season three, you know, basically what you're saying about characters who you thought would be villains. Uh, uh, you know, and the kind of being heroes are not that terrible. And, and right, probably the worst offender is again. Forgive me if I if I'm slipping on the character names, but the the Irishman who kind of leads the workers. How this guy led a race riot through season two, and now he's kind of almost a, not a hero, but you know, there's a lot more to his character. I mean, Jonathan. I mean, what's it like, kind of like like kind of doing an Anakin Skywalker, I guess, for the better <laughs> lack of a you know, just taking oh. a, a totally evil character well we don't look at any of the characters as evil and and my philosophy always is there are no good guys and there are no bad guys the only thing you have to know is nobody's innocent but every single one of our characters could kind of be the the star of their own show and so there has to be sympathy for all of them there has to be empathy for all of them and, and you have to there's a moment when you're rooting for every single person on the screen it doesn't matter what they've done um, and that's what, you know, these guys understand also, like, we don't have a Darth Vader theme. We don't have evil themes. It's like everyone is complicated. Everyone is a little bit broken and everyone has a chance to, to be the hero of their story. And that's kind of the philosophy of the show. What's it like for you, Scott and Reza, to turn around the character you may have had one distinctly bad impression of to uh, maybe thinking more about him? Reza, you want to talk about Larry's? Fanatic? Yeah. Uh Actually, it's interesting you mentioned Leary because that was probably my favorite um, development in this season. Um, because in, in the first two seasons, he he had a very defined theme for which was usually playing when he was uh, fighting people because he was very pugnacious quite frequently. And <coughs> that, that theme, it doesn't it's not very melodic in the way that you hear it. It's more like a like a heavy metal groove in a way. Like um, what's that, sorry? It's like thrashing guitars. It's, it's, it's a, like yeah. thrashing guitars. But there was a very slight melodic movement in the bass line of that, like ever so slight. And we just started from there and we fleshed it out in a very um, like harmonic way and started creating all these chords that would work around it. And it actually turned into a very beautiful piece of piano and orchestral music. Uh, that we ended up uh, using for his development of his internal conflict about some of the things that were going on in, in this season. So that was really my favorite. Yeah, and I really love uh, Father John. I particularly like the episode where uh, he and the uh, the dude who's now been forced into becoming like a, a Secret Service agent are held captive, and that's a fairly tragic episode in a way. And again, you you really that's see Chad. Father. That's, that's not Father June. That's that's Chad. Chad, yeah. I apologize. Yeah, okay. I'll I'll just keep you in. keep you on. <laughs> keep me honest. <laughs> what was that episode like? Uh, at scoring that episode. Uh, it's pretty neat. 
Uh, well, that was Chow, so let me make sure I'm thinking of the right person. What about Chow and, and Lee in the uh, train car? Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's actually a good one to pick out because that was a little bit of a departure musically uh, because the setting was so different. And, you know, we were out of our normal uh, Chinatown situation. Um, so we actually... <laughs> It's almost like a bluegrass hip hop, like <laughs> action music. <laughs> uh, and, you know, which that might be worth talking a little bit of, about our process, uh, especially on this uh, season, uh, which is essentially uh, Reza and I would get together and almost make like for every episode, almost make like an album in like three or four days where we make all these tracks and, and it's very kinetic and I'll pick up an instrument and he'll, and he'll like, you know, I wish I, I probably have some video of it somewhere of, of Rez just like I had this floor time and he's just like banging on it. And like, we're so kinetic. I'm just like, well, let's just record this on an iPhone. Even, you know, the, the, the energy was like, we've got to get this. Uh, we've got to stay with these um, inspirations that we have. And so uh, that episode in particular and others as well, uh, the way the music came together was very much like if you're making a record and passing instruments around and not a tremendous amount of like, hmm, what should we do here? A very instinctive. And then after you kind of make these creatures, then you go back in and you sculpt them and you use some of the craft and then we'll get some notes and see if, if it's a hit or a miss and then adjust accordingly. But uh, in general, uh, that was a really, that's, one of the reasons why I think our collaboration is, is successful, if I can say that, is because we sort of bring out this sort of Tasmanian devil energy in each other, and it's it's really fun. Yeah, no, totally. Now now to get to Father Jun, um, I thought that absolutely a tremendously moving scene was where his son essentially puts him out of his misery. And it's just such a gorgeous, haunting scoring. And also, you know, the eulogy uh, that's delivered over him as well in uh, last week's episode. As you want to talk about that a little bit? I mean, there's one big thing, right, is Perry with the flute, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, from the start, um, in the first episode of season one, um, we took an approach with this character uh, that was very different to all the other characters, which was that we used brass. Um, and there's not much brass elsewhere in the score, but his uh, entire sort of sonic palette is coming from, uh, you know, a brass section. And we really went into a sort of somber mood for that in, in this uh, season. And, you know, he had a decline uh, of some sort of mental state as well, which we used um, a lot of uh, interesting uh, sort of features with that as well. Um, and, you know, it just, like everything else in the school, we took the elements of what we began with in season one, and we just thought, how can we develop this in an unexpected way? either unexpected in an emotional way or unexpected in a sort of sonic treatment way. And that's essentially what we did with both of those cues. And the second one with which uh, the actor who actually plays um, Father June, Perry, he actually played that flute on the flute that he created himself. And we were sent samples of things that he recorded and then crafted them against those uh, horns that we use uh, throughout his theme. It's, it's really the only time I've experienced in anything I've worked on where the actor got involved in the score. But, you know, Perry, when Perry's not acting, he's a pan, he makes these Japanese flutes from hand. I, think, I don't want to say them from uh, Shaka Huchi flutes. Um, he makes them from wood, he carves them himself, and he plays them really beautifully. And so he asked in season, I, I don't know if it, did it come into season one or was it season two when we started with it? Um, I think we started it in season one, actually. Yeah. And there's a scene in either season one. Right? See him there's, playing on screen? Yeah, he yeah, played on screen. One. Was that season one or season two? I think it's season one. Or, I don't know. I think, it, uh, I think I in season it. one, there's a scene of Father June in repose just playing his flute. And uh, 
Perry said he'd love to get involved in putting that into the score. And we just decided that'd be a great way to include sort of a signature of the character into some of his score, which I've never, I've never seen that happen on anything else I've worked on. Yeah, no, it, it's great. So um, again, thanks to Lakeshore for uh, providing us with some digital giveaways. We've still got some more to go. So send in your questions. Now we've got a question from uh, Louis Versinelli. He's um, again, a big fan of the show. And he was particularly impressed with the track, The Final Battle, which is on Lakeshore season three episode. Now, of course we have the big finale. It's coming up this Thursday. If there are spoilers, we can't know, but I guess just sonically talk about putting that track together. If, if, it, if this is actually, in the last episode that's the last that's it right that's the last no. like you that is the last uh 10 or 12 or 15 or 18 minutes forget how long that cue is on the record but uh i have a feeling it's shorter than what it actually was in real life but it, that is the culmination if, if i'm thinking of the right track of uh of the entire uh season three so we, we won't give away any spoilers but what can be said is and uh, Rez can speak more to this, you know, it it had to do a lot of heavy lifting, as you would imagine, for a finale, uh, just doing the work of film composing. But we also wanted uh, to get in different themes of different characters whose story arcs were, you know, wrapping up or present in the ending. And so um, I would say it was, it was a tour de force. We worked really hard on it. That one definitely had some crafting and you know it wasn't just uh me and res jamming you know and you know that one we we definitely crafted really carefully because we had to weave all these themes in and out of each other and you know do the thing that you need to do when you're ending uh, a series but uh yeah we're really proud of that one did we put that first on the album. Yeah, we put it first on the, on the That's album. why we just put it first. We're like, we love this thing. We're but it. I'll tell you what else is, you know, I had a very clear idea in my head, not of the music, but just of the notion that there's a plot point that happens. And I don't know, let's say it's about 10 minutes before the end of the episode. And I wanted the score to start there and build and build and build and carry us to the final shot of the season. And that I knew even saying that to the composers, I was setting up a an almost impossible challenge, which was like, start here, don't stop till we're done, keep building, find all the emotional beats, and somehow with all the different characters and all the different themes, make it all of one piece. And and I knew I was giving them like probably a month's worth of work to do in about a week. But <laughs> um, you know, and 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 there were you were definitely, you know, you guys. I, I know you spent a lot of time on it and, and they would occasionally send pieces and back and forth and we would talk about it. But like, I, 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 I have to imagine when you guys get a note like that for me, it's kind of like, oh boy, like he doesn't even know what he's asking for. <laughs> like, you, know, you know what's funny? It's, I mean, we don't mind it. Like it's, it's quite fun in a way. It is stressful, but it's fun, stressful. I mean, you know, there is an energy in that queue and the energy is coming from the fact that Scott and I were just so frantic in the way that we're working. Um, literally, um, you know, one of us is on one computer with uh, headphones, one of us is on another computer, and we're both writing pieces of music for the same actual piece. And then we're just constantly sending each other files and it's like, open this in your session, I'll open this in my session. Because we didn't have enough time to have that the normal kind of, oh, I'll try this and oh, I'll try this. It was like, you know what? You try everything that's in your mind. I'll try everything that's in my mind and let's just throw this stuff at each other and see, <laughs> see how it ends up. That's right, I forgot about that. But it was great because we were still sitting in exactly the same room. Like Rez was just sitting like three feet away from me using his laptop and he would, hey, check this out. He'd play something for me like, okay, great. I know where that's going to go, so I can skip that spot right now because we're covered. So it was a really interesting way to work where we just, yeah, we were both full steam ahead, but sort of division of labor. And then we put it all together and then it was like, I think this really works. We'll find out. <laughs> you know? That's also a sequence where even in the writing of it, you know you're going to lean on the music to take you through it. Like sometimes you just write stuff and then you get to spotting and that's the first time you really think about music. And I think that's most of the time. But in this case, 
in the writing of that you know outline and figuring out that story we knew that when we hit this point that the music is going to have to carry us through because we're putting together so many discordant pieces and it's only going to be the music that that wraps it all together so that was like you know added pressure for you guys and to be fair like this season in particular this was not the first time we had sort of stretches of a lo long stretches of music where we had to build. So we kind of had those muscles flexed because there's that happened two or three times at least earlier in the season where that was the right way to approach that episode. Uh, one that comes into mind. Oh, I don't want to spoil anything, so I won't say the name. So I don't know where we are in the season. But, well, you can only see, you don't have to spoil the last one, but we're totally that's the only one we're waiting for. Okay, so then the, 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 I don't think this is yeah this is a different episode. There's a marriage. There's a big wedding that happens. Oh yes. Yeah, and that's, it's that's, aired, that's aired already. The wedding's already. Okay. Aired. And that's juxtaposed with, you know, all kinds of things is political, you know, campaign. The Godfather and sequence. Yeah. And that in particular, <laughs> um, you know, that was our sort of, you know, when you run a marathon, you run like 12 miles and then you run 17 miles and then you don't run anymore and then you just run the marathon. I, that was our 17 miler well, <laughs> prep for the end. So we were uh, we were ready to go by then. You know, one thing that's really struck me about the third season is that although there's terrific action, there really seems to be much, this season seems to be much more about emotion and intrigue than than just action scenes, although you definitely do get that. Um, I guess the, the question goes to even in the action, it's just a common question I have for anyone handling just amazing martial arts is how much of these movements do you hit or even try to hit or say we're just not even going to hit the hits. We're just going to play this overarching thing. What was the on Warrior? What was the mission statement? It's about musically hit. Yeah, Raz, I'll let you take this one. Yeah, I I like to hit a lot of stuff, but in a very subtle way. So we generally make a track that has a rhythm that hits most of the beats, but then obviously there's a lot of beats that we're not hitting. And what I like to do is to find instruments or percussions that subtly hint at those in-between things that are not happening exactly on the beat. If they totally don't work musically, then we just don't have them and we just let that one go. But quite often, uh, you know, if we can do an offbeat little percussion that is hitting an offbeat strike, it, it just adds that little extra sweetness. So we've got a question from Dale. Uh any instrument choice things that you can share with us, ways that you make things sound like part of the world of the culture, but not overly wearing a certain sound on your musical sleeves. Like, again, like how Asian did you want to make this? Because one thing that I really love about the show, there are kind of two shows going on here. There's kind of like a period piece with white characters and whatever they've got going on and an entirely different show with the, with the Asan and, and his world. I, what, I think what? That's... Sorry, you go, Scott. Chris? Well, one of the things I was just going to say is that um, culturally, because of the Wu-Tang Clan, because their whole uh, concept as a hip hop outfit was sampling bits of Kung Fu movies and then flipping that into hip hop. Um, it was a decision that we made from the very beginning that we want to <laughs> communicate the more Asian influences more through a style of hip hop that harkens back to that kind of Wu-Tang Clan that has brought that idea into uh, a cultural awareness, you know, rather than just straight up going with um, Asian instruments or, you know, melodies. But anyway, over to you, Scott. Yeah, and I would say in this, in season three, there are cases where we were really confronted with like, oh, well, there's, there's people on screen playing you know, air who and drums. And, you know, there's this one scene that's like a puppet show. And, you know, we have to have, you know, we have to have Chinese music there because it's, it's supposed to be happening in that moment. And we're supposed to be hearing the sort of theatrical performance of this puppet show. So there's air who and these drums, but then slowly uh, that score takes over and hands off to this sort of, phantasmagorial music that's kind of an allegory to the puppet show is has more meaning than just a puppet show it, it's a it's a metaphor for what's going on and we put a lot of thought into how do we 
start with those instruments, which were just proper Chinese instruments that were pre-recorded actually by the, you know, by the music supervisors who need to have all that ready for the set. How do we transition from that into score, pay our respects, and then just hand off into what we're doing? Similarly, the same thing happened in that uh, marriage wedding. You know, it starts out very ceremonial, but, you know, we're doing nothing like that. So I think that um, when the things are on screen, we embrace them and let them be as authentic as, as they can be. And then we'll usually at some point hand off to score. And then when we want to in-score how those influences, they're more abstract, more sampled, more coming from like a, that kind of perspective. And I, I think it's important to note that one of the important objectives, objectives of the show from day one that were put out there by Justin Lin and Shannon Lee was that we really do want to subvert the tropes and stereotypes that have sort of plagued Asian cinema in, in the United States for so long. And so part of that is not playing into the, any of the stereotypes on screen with the characters and, and the storylines and the way they behave. And part of that also has to do with the score, which is you know, there are certain stereotypical scores that have been used for generations uh, in, the, in the American versions of, you know, representing Chinese culture and music. And our goal was to make sure, you know, we didn't fall into any of those traps and just scored it like we would score anything else. Yeah, I mean, there's some really fantastic twists and turns in the season. Um, I mean, I was shocked that Mark Descascos lost a fight. I'm very disappointed in my Lynn. Uh, <laughs> but I guess my question for you, John, or for all of you, is there are there any places that you really didn't see these characters going on? What are you most shocked by? Uh, a, a, something a character did, and how did that reflect on your creative choices? Well, that's going to be for them because I wasn't shocked by anything. So. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think of something that's not a spoiler. Uh, something that's happened before. You know, a shocking character thing. twist. Well, there's more shock to come. Uh, uh, Rez, do you have anything that comes to mind? Yeah, I do have something that comes to mind. I, I get shocked by some of the violence sometimes. Um, the, the, the one scene in this, in this season where um, someone's like mouth was put on a table and they were like, oh, I was just like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, we did a, that was a, Leary did a curb stomp on the bar in episode nine. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, I just was like, oh, ouch. Leary. 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 Sometimes Leary the score is just Reza going, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> Leary had a pretty big, you know, arc that was unexpected. I mean, really? we are also privy to discussions, you know, occasionally. Um, so we, we're we not either fully shocked either because we kind of, you know, Jonathan will tell us some things about what's happening in the writing room and, and you know, this person is, is gotten killed off or whatever. Um, but, you know, I, w I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say shocked because everything felt prepared and, uh, you know, like there was... There was a reason why these characters behave this way other than, hey, it's season three and we need to spice it up. Like, so the, uh, you know, that's a compliment to Jonathan. They, they you know, they're, they're very rich. And when they make a move, uh, whether you agree with it or not, it's it, you usually can understand their motivations pretty clearly, which is great. Right. Now, here's a question from Esteban Cortez. How many of the instruments you used are real instruments and how many are sampled instruments? That's a tricky question. Uh, not to not to be uh, not to obfuscate, but everything is a performance. Let's start there. So we don't really differentiate between whether uh, I pick up a guitar, which would be a real instrument, or Rez hits a drum back there, or we come over to the keyboard and perform something on a drum sound. Well, that's never going to stop. Or a uh, or a uh, a sample of strings you know even sometimes if we use a synth we might use a piece of outboard gear that's synth or we might re-record it through an amp so i think the key to us is what you won't see a lot of us doing or what you what you won't see us doing a lot of i should say is 
a lot of like detailed programming. Like you can work in a computer and it's it's not a knock on this. Both of us have done it on other shows and it's another way of working. It's But the way we work on this show is everything is performed. And so if it's not right, then we do another take or punch in like you. Whereas the sound, some of them might be generated from the computer or they might be generated from an acoustic source in a room that we record. That balance is probably 70, 30 or higher acoustic, you know, natural recordings. But when we do reach to the computer, it's not a compromise. It's because that's just as interesting of a sound. And then we, it's a performance that we capture. Um, man, well, again, I haven't seen the last one, but how any warrior season four, what, what do you musically have in store for it? Or where, where do you see your respective work going for it? I don't know. Do we have a season four? Did, did something happen that I don't know about? I mean, we're not going to know about a season four till after the strike. Uh, I am optimistic we'll have a season four. I think this show, from what I hear, has been performing really well on the platform. But I, you know, until the strike's over, I don't think there'll be any communication about that. Yeah, I think I think the next place to go is it's it's really it's going to be dictated by Jonathan and the team and, and where they take the yeah, story. It's, it's really Josh and Evan, uh, the, the, the new showrunner, yeah, Josh and Evan, who, who had been on the show for the first two seasons and took over showrunning duties uh, for season three. Uh, you know, they're, they're already, I know, deep into thought about where this goes for season four. And, uh, you know, I think all we need is the green light and we'll get moving. How, how oh, does more this... Cowbell. Sorry? Sorry? More cowbell. More cowbell. <laughs> One of the things I want to say, actually, uh, from our perspective, is that it's such a joy at this point to, I mean, it's always been a joy, but especially now it's a joy to work on this show because we we kind of have developed a language and we have some trust. And it, it, it's so nice when Jonathan says to us, you know, you guys know what you're doing. Just feel it out. Just do what you want, you know, which we had a lot of in this season. It was really great, and it was one of the things that inspired Scott and I to push things into a completely different direction or, or an unexpected direction, let's say, because we were just playing and we were just feeling, and and that speaks to some of the stuff, stuff Scott was talking about, like how we were operating more as a band rather than as composers, because um, it was really a lot based in inspiration. How, how does this collaboration stand out for, I mean, obviously you guys have tons of work before this, but how does this particular collaboration uh, stand out for you between the three of you? Well, I have the easy part. I just, I just show up and listen. Um, it's probably a better question for those two. I just love the idea that, you know, we've done this, we've done now 30 episodes, but even when we'd only done the first 10, that I can just throw an idea out there. And because these guys were so created the sound of the show and, and you know, it's the same thing when I design fights, right? I write a fight, but then of course the stunt coordinators do something completely different. I'm just trying to convey an idea. I convey an idea to them, but these are the guys who created the sound and the themes of the show. And so at some point that becomes a, a <clears throat> almost like a reverse, a reverse way of thinking, which is that, well, if it comes from Reza and Scott, then it belongs on the show. And so it, it becomes, my job has gotten way easier uh, over the seasons, because these guys are now pretty much the sound of the show. So the only time I'll step in or the showrunners will step in is if we want something to mean something a little differently than maybe they've assumed when they've scored it, because we haven't had a conversation about it. Because one of the things we kind of stopped doing was spotting sessions, because we didn't feel we we needed them, because I felt these guys really, you know, instinctively know the show so well. So every once in a while, we will miss we'll 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 miss a cue together. But it's really, you'd have to talk to them about how they keep their collaboration fresh. I imagine, you know, date nights every so often. Yeah. <laughs> Absence makes the heart grow fonder. I mean, the time that we didn't see each other, Reza went on to become like a, a yogi and also have a really re-blossoming of his career as an artist, which he can speak to. But one thing I just want to say real quick is, I think one of the reasons why the collaboration has the three you know this collaboration has been successful is is actually because we auditioned um i used to be pretty anti-audition and the, <laughs> the benefit of auditioning is 
when you win, it's usually a home run and you there's this feeling like you've solved the show. And so we always started the process with some degree of trust. It's like, okay, these guys get it. And like that feeling in the beginning of a relationship, like, are they going to get it? Are they going to get it? And overcoming that is one of the hardest obstacles. And I think what Jonathan is saying now is he's not asking that question anymore. Obviously we're at season three now. It's just like, are we, are we doing the story justice? Are we, are we saying what we want to say here? You know, or, uh, but I'll let Reza. No, it was basically, you said it perfectly. It's really, the questions come up when, you know, different people interpret the narrative in a different way. Um, and then we just need to have a conversation about that. Who is it? No. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? So I guess my, my wrap-up question for you guys. Um, I mean, again, this is such a fantastic show. I mean, for me, I just really cannot think of a better martial arts show that's ever been on television. Uh, and right. With all respect to Kung Fu. Um how, when you just look at what you've accomplished with these three seasons, you know, as a storyteller, as musicians, how do you think that you've lived up to the spirit of Bruce Lee, of what Bruce had hoped to do with the show and how he hoped to change television with it? That's a composer question, right? No, it's a question <laughs> for you as well. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll toss this one to Rez because uh, I don't know. I don't think you brought this up in this interview, but he's been obsessed with Bruce Lee like a very long time, right? So maybe you could speak to that and whether or not you feel like you know you've measured up or not. Uh, I, measuring up, and I, I feel like I'm not the person to determine that. You know, we just try to do our best, and then you know, pray that people like it. But Rez really had a, a, a Bruce Lee was like a kind of like a hero to you, right? Yeah, Bruce Lee is like my ultimate hero in life. Um, I, I'm i Iranian ethnically, and I grew up a little bit in Iran when I was uh, up to the age of five. And Bruce Lee was a massive star there uh, when I was a kid. So I just remember like as a child looking up to this guy and being like, I want to be like him. I remember that. I remember having that feeling when I was four years old. and. It's been something that has carried through my entire life and, and in different ways as I've got older. You know, initially when I was younger, it was like, I want to learn how to do martial arts like that. I want to be tough like that. I want to be whatever. And I, as I got older, I got much more interested in his philosophies about life, in his way of um, uh, tr basically um, presenting ideas in Taoism into Western culture. And a lot of the things that we talk about today uh, are really attributable to Bruce Lee that we don't even think about. Like when we say, oh, this person's got a good energy or this person's got a bad energy or, you know, I don't like the vibe of this or, you know, all these things are really, they had no precedence before Bruce Lee in our culture, you know. And he, he was just such a monumental force of nature. And he, I don't know, he, he, he just really had this great way of bridging 5,000 years of knowledge into the modern age. And so that's something that I've always been very conscious of. And when it came to this show, I really tried, I, I meditate, I, I'm a Taoist myself, and I tried to get myself into a state where, you know, as much as I felt that I could, I was trying to align myself with the, the historical energy that led to this point from the inception in Bruce Lee's mind. And I don't know if, you know, I got it or I, I didn't get it, but I feel good in the fact that I did the preparation work myself to try and uh, find that alignment. Well, again, I think, you, I, I think you really, you know, paid his spirit forward, Reza and, and Scott and Jonathan. I just want to thank you all for joining us at Film Music Live. I want everyone to watch the three seasons of Warrior on Max with the big... Uh, bust up on this Thursday. Uh, Scott and Reza's score for seasons one, two, and three are available on Lakeshore Records, whom I thank for providing our non-counterfeit giveaways. A special thanks to our producers, Mark Northam and Dale Turner, designer Mark Banning, the team at Lakeshore Records, and Alex Beck-Weinstein and Jana Davidoff at Rhapsody PR. And I'll see you on the next Film Music Live. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.